So, okay, uh, let me introduce our speaker for today. Um, we have here George Riley from Scott Gold Resources. Um, George, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're going to speak about today without giving too much away? Yes, okay. Uh, so my name's George. Uh, I work for Scott Gold Resources, uh, based in Tyndrum. Uh, so I'm a geologist by trade. Uh, I'm a recent graduate, so I've been graduated about two years. Um, and I work uh, yeah, doing all the geology at Scott Gold. Uh, so exploration and mine geology. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, we also have here Gillian White, who is the Solution Centre Manager for the Subsurface Solution Centre. And uh, Gillian, would you like to tell us why we have chosen this today and why it is of interest? Yeah, uh, so welcome to George. Thank you for being here. The three reasons are, first one, I grew up in Perthshire, beautiful part of the world. And when I heard there was gold in them, their hills, I wanted to find out a lot more about it especially when it's now become commercial. It's taken a while for that to happen. Um, the technology application, I think, is outstanding here. We, this, is the first, this will be the first commercial gold mine in Scotland, um, and a very interesting way that it's being done in an area of outstanding natural beauty. Uh, so really looking forward to finding out about how this is actually being achieved and the amount of investment needed. I think there's a big knock-on effect for potential other types of mining um, when, we look, when we look ahead to different types of heavy minerals, battery minerals and so on. And thirdly, it's Christmas, so gold, <laughs> top theme. Is that a hint as a Christmas present? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, well, thank you very much. Um, George, are you ready? I think so, yeah. yeah. Okay, there's 20 minutes on the clock. Um, away you go. Thank you. Yep, so I'm going to talk about the uh, past, present, and uh, future potential of gold in Scotland. Uh, so I'm going to cover three gold rushes um, so that have occurred in Scotland. Uh, the first being Lead Hills down the, in the borders, uh, the Stratford Kildine and Gold Rush in the far northeast, and the Tyndrum Gold Rush, uh, which is in the West Highlands. Uh, so Lead Hills region uh, has been worked quite extensively in the past uh, for copper, uh, lead, uh, zinc, and also silver. Um, and it was gold was first produced there during the reign of James IV. Um, and it's, it's thought that mining actually dates back to Roman times. Um, so the gold in the region is noted for its uh, high purity and fineness, um, and the gold rush occurred in the 16th century between 1538 and 1542. So at its peak, over 300 men worked across three uh, summers, and the uh, total value of this gold is believed at today's money to have been uh, about 500 million pounds that was extracted. Uh, and most interestingly, the Crown of Scotland was repaired uh, with gold that came from uh, this area. Uh, so the next and probably the most uh, famous gold rush uh, is occurred in Stratford Kildonan in uh, 1869. Um, so gold was actually first found in 1818 when a, a solitary gold nugget um, was found in the river Kildonan, which is just in the bottom uh, right of the screen there. Uh, but it wasn't until 1869 that the uh, public's attention was really grabbed when an article was published in a local newspaper. Um, and this caused a big scramble, uh, and over 600 men at its peak were working the various rivers and burns in the area. Um, so the, the land is owned by the uh, Duke of Sutherland, and I believe it still is today, and he imposed a licensing system of uh, a pound for a 40 square foot claim, um, and a 10% royalty. Uh, so unsurprisingly, some of the fines went without being uh, publicized. Um, and it came to an abrupt end on the 30th of December when there was conflict with uh, more traditional sort of crafting and fishing land use, and the Duke decided not to offer any more permits. <coughs> so this is uh, a bit blurry, sorry, but this is just what it looked like at its peak with the uh, various huts just camped on the riverside in the uh, town of gold which sprung up. Uh, so those, I've been speaking to a few avid panners just now, 
Um, and you might have seen in the news this, this large nugget that was found uh, over four ounces. Um, so gold panning is sort of grown in popularity, um, aided by uh, the sort of publications of large finds. Um, so the traditional areas of panning are Tyndrum, where, where I work, uh, one lock head to the south and led um, and Helmsdale to the north. Um, and the, each year we have the British Championships in May and in 2017 it was the uh, World Championships. Uh, so the next gold rush I'm going to look at and this the focus of the talk really is the one in Tyndrum. So these are a few uh, newspaper cuttings from the archive at work uh, showing the uh, publicity in the 80s when they first discovered gold at Connanesh. And John Burton here is the landowner who uh, is still around and pops up to site occasionally to see us. So a bit about the project background. So in uh, 1984, the vein was discovered on the hillside by Enox uh, using boulder tracing. And they, they traced up the hill and found the vein outcropping. Uh, between 84 and 1991, uh, a significant amount of exploration was undertaken. Um, so this involved surface and underground drilling, um, and they opened an exploration adit into the hillside for a kilometer, and it's, this adit is still there today, and that's, that's what we're using as the primary uh, means of access into the deposit. Uh, so then a feasibility study was undertaken, and in 96, the project was uh, acquired by Caledonia Mining. Uh, Sorry, 95, and in 96, uh, planning per permission was granted. Um, but 2000, uh, there was a crash in the gold price, which led to the project being put on, on hold and on care and maintenance uh, before it was acquired and picked up in 2007 by Scott Gold. And this, this is just a view for those of you who don't know the area. So the, the hill on the right covered in snow with the uh, scar in it, so that's where the mine is, just up there, you can sort of see it. And then Ben Louis is, is to the left, and that's the River Commonish. Uh, so this is a couple of pictures from uh, Enix took. Uh, so this is what the adit looked like. So this was developed using traditional uh, hand drilling methods uh, with the rails and, and carts there. And a few of these carts still found in the village as flower pots and stuff like that. Um, and that's uh, part of the vein exposure in the main ore zone. Uh, it's a quick bit on the uh, geology. So it's basically, you can be simplified to one big quartz vein uh, that is uh, located along a fault. And it's thought that this is a, a shear and a, a fault that is a splay off the larger regional Tyndrum fault. Um, and it formed uh, in the Grampian orogeny 400 million years ago. Uh, so the host rocks are uh, schists and opelites and quartzites. Um, so the vein dips steeply to the southwest. Uh, it's several generations of quartz mineralization and it's a uh, sulfide vein. So it's primarily pyrite but also um, galena and chalcopyrite. And it's these sulfides that, that host the gold that we're interested in. Um, so a lot of people have been asking if you can see the gold. So the there is some visible gold, but it's, it's quite rare, and it's um, about 100 microns, so it's, it's quite difficult to see. Uh, so in general, you, you don't see it. Uh, so, so yeah, where is the gold? Uh, so the picture on the left is a typical uh, view of the high-grade vein. So the, it's this grey portion in the centre, um, and there's also gold in this, this vein to the uh, material to the either side, but the grade sort of drops off. Um, and this central picture uh, shows a sample of the high grade material that's been cut and polished. And it, the gold is located within the uh, coarse pyrite and also within some of these cold stringer veins, these uh, gray fine veins that go through the sample. And then the uh, photo on, on, the, on the other side uh, shows, shows the gold and it's locked up in the pyrite. So that's why we have to crush it to uh, liberate the gold. So this is what the mine looked like when Scott Gold acquired the project in 2007. Uh, with the old carts and rails still there. It was all locked up. Uh, so between 2009 and 2012, um, 
quite a few drilling campaigns are undertaken, uh, both underground and at the surface. And this allowed the mineral resource estimate to be up updated and it increased the resource. Um, yeah, uh, and then in 2016, you might have seen, uh, those of you who followed the project, we had the bulk processing trial, um, and this uh, allowed us to test the amenability of the ore, and it raised some, uh, some, some money and also some interest, further interest in the project. Uh, so the final plan of permission was uh, approved in 2018, and I joined a couple of months after. Uh, the final finance was secured in, in May of 2018, um, and we started underground mining work in January of, of this year. So these are a couple of images of the work by Scott Gold. So there's Gavin drilling <laughs> underground uh, and it, with an AQ rig. Um, this is, is Davy and Yeti on the hill uh, in waist deep snow, uh, doing some NQ drilling. Uh, so that's Ben Louie in the background, and then this is Ben Hearn, which is the, the core bit that um, the miners is, is within, and some drilling in slightly better weather. Uh, these are a couple of pictures of the BPT and the first gold produced in uh, Scotland commercially. Um, so there's the, the conveyor, uh, the watch and the shaking table here, and the central one, obviously the exciting one, the molten gold being poured. And as part of this, we produced 10 one ounce gold rounds, which have the Scottish gold mark, which is this stag's head. Uh, and these were auctioned off, and the average price paid was, I think, just over £4,000, which shows the sort of a premium uh, price attached to this product. Uh, so these are a couple of uh, just the parameters for the project. So the reserve is uh, over uh, half a million tonnes. Um, a resource grade of 14.8 grams a ton. So that gold equivalents, that's both gold and silver. Uh, we're high grade mine, so of always a small mine, it's, it's very high grade, uh, low tonnage, uh, 11.8. Life of mine is anticipated to be nine years, although there's a potential that if we find stuff surrounding, that would increase. Uh, we're a low cost producer, and we're looking to employ 63 people uh, at peak production and as many of those will be local as, as is possible. Uh, so this is just a bit about the mining process. Um, so this is the, the mine development. So the, the stuff in yellow, so this is the addict, this trace through here that exists. Everything else will be constructed from now on. Uh, so the yellow is all the development, so the, the various drives and raises and ramps. And these allow us to access the ore and then the green uh, rectangles, they're the individual stopes, and they are where the, the high-grade material that we'll be mining uh, is located. So the mining process is uh, called top-down long-hole open stoping on retreat, which is a mouthful. basically means we mine deposit from the top downwards uh, on retreat back towards the portal. Um, so we'll be using trackless diesel electric machinery uh, and we basically drill holes between the sublevels and blast the material out, and then this is then trucked out. Uh, so at the moment, operation is five days a week, uh, although we'll be moving to six days a week and three shifts in a few months. Uh, so just to illustrate the process, we've got a few images here. So this is what the portal looks like now, so it's not changed much since the NX days. Um, so the first step is to drill the face, so that's the, the boom rig just there on the right. Uh, after drilling, so another view of the drilling here. Um, so after drilling, you load the holes with explosives, and uh, there's Ian, he press, presses the magic button, and uh, it blasts it, and then we wait for the dust and the gas to settle before it's safe for us to go back in. Uh, so this is a view of what the blasted muck pile looks like. Um, and the next step is then to roof bolt, and you scale down any loose rock, and you install roof bolts um, just to ensure the ground is secure. And then we muck out, and then the whole process begins again. So at the moment, we're stockpiling development ore. Uh, we are widening the existing adit, to, so it'll allow the scoop tram and, and larger drill rig to fit in. Um, We've just started ramp development in the past couple of days and weeks, 
and we're hoping to blast the first stope next year. Um, and then we'll be looking to finance the, the purchase of additional equipment as the mine grows. So ma major uh, process being undertaken at the moment is constructing the site for the uh, processing plant. So we've got a lot of groundwork going on at the moment and they are preparing the flat site. Uh, they're also preparing the ground for the first couple of tailing stacks. So they're stripping the peat off, putting the geomembrane down. Um, and we're also constructing settlement ponds that will allow us to, to reuse some of the water. So the plant equipment has come from South Africa, China, and uh, Europe, and this is now all within the country. Um, quite a lot of it's on site, and this is just showing us pre-assembling it with a big crane, and we're assembling as much as we can so when the plant foundation is done, we can lay it onto there, um, because a lot of this is quite big, so it won't necessarily fit through the front door, so you've got to sort of build the plant around it. So this is a uh, mock-up of what the plant will look like. So it's designed to have a minimal visual impact. Uh, so it's low profile. It will be painted a sort of uh, mossy green color to blend in with the hillside. There's no skylight, so there'll be no light pollution. Um, so the mine portal is just, just above it. It's built into the hillside. Uh, so we've had a couple of questions about how we process the gold. Uh, I, I've got a clearer image on some paper I can show you after. So this is the, uh, what's inside the shed. Um, so the first step is to crush the ore with the jaw crusher uh, to get it to a smaller size. And this is then fed into the ball mill, which is here. And this will grind it to a few microns in size. And then it will be fed through the gravity circuit. So this is a cyclone uh, and shaking tables. And this will result in 25% of the gold being recovered. So this is the free gold. And that will be melted into a, a dore bar on site. The remainder is recovered in the flotation circuit and uh, the tailings, we basically recover as much water as possible and reuse in the plant and stack the dry material um, around the site. Uh, so innovation is obviously a theme of the center and these talks. Um, so a few of the things that were innovative of this project. Um, the first is the way we're gonna store the tailings. Uh, so we've obviously all seen in the news these big tailings pond disasters, so they can happen, and uh, industry is trying to move away from it. Um, so one of the methods is to stack the tailings, as we're doing. Um, so we're going to stack and revegetate them, and we're going to try and mimic the glacial features that you see in the Connanish Glen. Uh, and the second innovative thing at Scott Gold that I've picked out is uh, we're involved in the Iron for Raw program. Uh, so this is looking to recover critical metals and elements, such as tellurium, uh, from our ore. Um, so they're just doing a lot of test work. So this is what the guy is doing on the right, uh, down at Wheel Jane in Cornwall, and he's just doing a batch uh, flotation test there. Um, so I've primarily been involved with the exploration since I was employed. So Scott Gold have 13 Crown option areas. This gives us permission from the uh, Crown Estate Scotland to explore. Uh, for gold in Scotland, uh, all but two of these, apart from the Ockel licenses, uh, are located within the, within the Grampian terrain. So this runs out into Ireland, and this is very prospective, but relatively underexplored. Um, so obviously hosts Connanish, and then current Yolt project in Ireland, which is six million ounces, and the Cabinet Coal Gold Mine. So yeah, like I said, this is primarily my work. Uh, some pictures I've taken. Uh, on top of the hill while we've been sampling or within streams. Both on good days, it's not always like that. <laughs> um, so mostly, yeah, the last 18 months have been out on the hillside collecting soil samples, collecting stream samples. Uh, I was also involved in a quite a big geophysics survey over Connanesh, which allowed us to uh, image the vein at depth and possibly some extensions to it. Um, and also, yeah, obviously geological mapping. Uh, so we're using this new soil technique. Uh, I say new, it's been around for 30 years, but it's only been adopted quite in the last decade by the mining industry. Um, so we tested it over Connanish. So the rectangle there shows where the Connanish vein is. So no surprise, we found gold there. Um, but we've got these additional anomalies to the south and southwest. Um, 
And these potentially are offset structures, uh, possibly veins, uh, maybe sheared veins. So these are potential future drill targets, and ultimately these might be added to the resort in the future. I should say uh, the grid also needs extending uh, to the northeast. That's the job for next year. Uh, so then our next prospect, uh, you might have seen if you follow Scott Rod, we did press release on this recently. Uh, so this is our Invercorican prospect, which is located um, down 12 kilometers southwest along Strike. Uh, it sits on the Tyndrum Fault, um, which is a, a quite a large regional fault through the area. Um, it's just to the north of, of Loch Fine. Um, so NX, who actually discovered Scott God, had done quite a bit of work down here. So we followed this up, applying this new technique, and we found this, the pink blob. It's a linear anomaly. Um, as you can see, the grid is open. We've recently extended that, and we're going to publish the results in the coming weeks. And stream sediments here, the pinks and oranges are high, and this shows that there's a potential that this continues further along strike. There's limited exposure, so the soil sampling is sort of our best way of gaining an understanding of what's there. Uh, so going forwards, um, we're going to continue mapping and sampling programs over the, all the prospects we've got. And uh, then the more pr prospective areas will um, we'll be using geophysics, ground geophysics. Uh, we're hoping to have an airborne regional survey um, next year although potentially it might go into the year after. And in 2021, we're going to be hopefully drilling these drill targets that myself and my uh, colleague have been defining uh, the past two years. And the aim of this is to develop a pipeline of projects in Scotland, um, and hopefully we can establish Scotland as a, a mining centre. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, George. That was a very interesting talk, and I must admit, I, I do like the view out of your office window. is, yeah, uh, is it's great. Not bad, is it? <laughs> it's bad. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. So, I'd like to open the floor up to questions, and if you have one, could you please wait for the microphone? Who's first? Oh, you can have this one. How many? boreholes um, have you got across the Coronich deposit, just to delineate it out of um, interest? And is it predominantly diamond, or is it RC as well? Or? No, so there's no RC, so it's all, all diamond. Uh, I think there's probably near 100, but they're not all deep, so the deepest is about 370. Usually it's about 150 to 200 metres. So they sort of intercept the vein, go beyond it, and, and sort of stop the hole there. Um, so part of our job has been sort of re-looking at the old core, um, and some of the newer stuff, and, and sort of refining the geological model that we've got. Um, but the cores have not been best looked after, and it is older than me back in the 80s. So yeah, some of it is, is not in the best condition. But yeah, that's part of the, part of the job. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's where the two samples came from over there. Because as you know, cores should be in boxes, but <laughs> not all of it was. <laughs> Thank you for a, an interesting presentation. Uh, I've got another friend who runs a gold exploration company, and I understand the cost of drilling the cores for exploration is quite expensive. Yeah, it is. And yeah. Uh, so I was going to ask, uh, is there much technology being developed, and could there be some synergies with what we're doing in oil and gas? Um, I don't know too much about the technologies, to be honest. Uh, I know, yeah, it's very expensive. It's probably about 180 pounds for a meter. So if you think you're going down to 400 meters and you're going to do 10, 20 holes, it soon adds up. Um, so that's why obviously you do exploration holes to begin with. But yeah, the drilling uh, back in the 80s, it was sort of, sort of rudimentary surveys of it. Um, the newest stuff surveyed a bit more accurately, but yeah, I'm, I'm not too sure about the technology, to be honest. I think I just know from, from being at uni and studying that I know the mining industry is quite reluctant to embrace technology, whereas oil and gas sort of get on board as quickly as possible. So. 
No, we're, we're the same. I mean, that's, uh, <laughs> but uh, I did see in Ireland they've recently been using percussion drilling, I think, to get cores out. Uh, uh, yes, so you can do sense. sonic drilling and stuff like that, but that's only to get through the overbed. And, uh, we potentially, yeah, could do RC drilling. The only problem with that is it's quite dusty and a dirty method. Sort of the quick and dirty way, so, and you, you don't get as good a sample, so I think if we are to do it, we'll either use the rig we've got or contract it out and do diamond drilling. Um, yeah. Coming from the oil business, where we like to gather a lot of data downhole, do yeah. you do any downhole surveys apart from directional? Uh, we, we haven't in the past, and I know in, in mining it's often not done. Um, it sort of depends on, on the deposit you've got uh, and what kind of tool you put down and, and what you're looking for, really. Because um, I know you can pick up certain types of mineralization if you put a camera down or whatever, but I don't, I think as a junior mining company, we probably wouldn't look at something like that. We just look to get the recovery and get it assayed, I think. <laughs> You were talking earlier about ionic leach soil sampling. Yes. I did have a slide on that, but I took it out because, um, well, it's chemistry that bores a lot of people, and I was a bit pressed for time. Right, let me ask, <laughs> let, me, let me get to the question I was actually going to ask in that case, which yeah. is uh, airborne surveys. Yes. How yeah. would you spot gold from the air? That is basically, you, you do it, and that is to look more for the structures that host the gold. So I mentioned the Tyndrum Fault. So there's a bit of debate about the deposit, whether it's an orogenic gold, reduced intrusion, and they still don't know. Uh, but orogenic gold deposits typically are splays off large, larger faults. So if you look at deposits in uh, Canada, Alaska, places like that, um, sort of like a textbook, orogenic to be near a fault. So we'd, we'd want to pick up those, because as you know, in the highlands, it's, it's all peat, bogs, steep hills. So if you can cover the ground quickly with a helicopter, um, and pick out these structures, then it will allow us to focus down because we've got over we've got 2,900 kilometers squared of ground, and currently only two field geologists. So <laughs> it's a lot of area, and anything that can help us get the no next mine up and running quickly is, is a good thing. So that's what we'd be looking to do. Most of the gold you're finding is very small, very, yeah. you know, seen embedded within the pyrite and yeah, that. Yeah. The panners who work in Tindrum burn are obviously finding much coarser gold. Yes, yeah. So are they, is their gold from a different source, or are they just seeing the top 2% of your gold population? Well, yes, this is, this is like the, the conundrum and no one sort of knows the answer, because, yeah, you'd think, you can find it in the Connor, so this river here has... You can pan it and find gold, um, but in the mine, we, we're not seeing it. So, it, I mean, some of it is obviously coming from the mine, but it's, the potential is that it's, it's in the till, and it's, it's from elsewhere, and it's, it's been moved, and it's that that's eroding. Um, because these, these rivers are panned all the time, yet you can always find gold, so it must be refreshing from somewhere. Um, so that's sort of like my view, but there are academics at Leeds that, Rob Chapman, who's uh, worked with Scott Gold in the past, and what he does is he pans and then he um, looks at the gold grains and analyzes the chemistry, and you get sort of a fingerprint on the grains, and that can sort of show you the potential source. Um, and they're going to come up and speak to us in the next sort of next few months because uh, they've got a PhD student who's been going around doing that, um, and he's he's sort of found populations. Um, of gold. So, please, could I ask a commercial question? Because I'm not a geologist or a yeah. uh, chemist or an oil worker. But um, so, my wedding ring, which maybe you can see, is made yeah. of Scottish gold. Yeah. And you mentioned that uh, you auctioned some of the coins, four thousand pounds a coin. Yeah. So my question is, should I keep my wedding ring? <laughs> or, sh or should I sell it? And before you answer, George, my wife is in the room. No, I'd, I'd keep it. Um, <laughs> a 
at least at least until the price has gone up a bit more. But yeah. <laughs> there, there is a there's a market for Scottish gold. Uh, it's quite hard, like a lot of these things, because it's it's on people's perception and what they invest value in. So it's quite hard to quantify. Uh, I think we've done obviously studies on it. Um, but ultimately, we don't know until we're producing what the demand for that is. Um, so we've got two jewellers that are taking the gold from us. So there's Hamilton and Inches in Edinburgh that are, uh, obviously supply stuff to royalty. And then there's Sheila Fleet based up in Orkney. Uh, and they're the two that are taking it. So there's potential that more people want Scottish gold. Um, and we're, we're looking in the future to process the flotation concentrate in Scotland. So that means it'll be a closed system and all the gold will be produced in Scotland, mined in Scotland, and made into jewellery or whatever. So, yeah, in terms of the, the value of it, I, I don't know what it'll, it'll go up to. <laughs> um, hi, George. Hi um, thank you for your talk. I love the photos that you took. So my question is, aside from the existence of faults, are there other surface manifestations or features that you're looking for to you know, to identify if there's a deposit of gold. Yeah, uh, I'll just go back a few pictures, slides. Uh, but these, these quartz veins in the area are huge. Um, I'll just find one. Sorry. <laughs> Too many slides. This, this one, sorry. Yep, so this is known as the mother vein. So behind, you can see that scar, and that's where the river's hitting this quartz vein. And that, that quartz vein, you can trace for three kilometers long strike, and it's, it's huge. Um, my profile picture on Facebook is me standing on it, and it's about six meters wide. Um, and you think, oh, lovely, this host gold. It's, it's been drilled, and, and they've, they've not really found stuff in it. But then when we've done soil sampling over it, it, it does have gold in there. So whether they've drilled it badly or whether it's just low, low quantities, it's, it's, it's not really known. Um, but yeah, they're just sort of visual indicators. Otherwise, it is just mapping on incredibly steep hillsides. Um, it's not always in situ, so that's an issue. Um, but yeah, Con Connish is sort of a structural deposit, we think. Um, so your best bet is really to look at the structures and, and the geochemistry. And that's how we're going about it. My question is, can we find the gold in Aberdeenshire? Uh, yeah, I saw that on the website. Uh, I don't know too much about Aberdeenshire geology. I know there's the, the Rhiney Church, I think, um, and they're quite a historic gold occurrence. Uh, I don't think our license errors extend quite up this way. But the, the slide that had the, the belt running through, all that is perspective, and a lot of it's not been explored. Um, so there's the potential that there's, there's stuff very close to here. Uh, but obviously, it's not just finding the mine, it's got to be in the right area. You can't mine, if there's a vein under Aberdeen, you're not going to dig it up. So it's got to be in a, in a, in a good location. Um, ours is obviously in the park, which formed after the discovery. And that's sort of complicated, bringing it to production. Because it's more stringent environmental controls. But uh, when we're in production, we'll have proved it's done. And I personally think that will mean that other people are going to reconsider Scotland as a place to invest. Um, thanks for an interesting talk. I'll give you a boring question. What was the software that you used for the 3D visualization with all the stopes and stuff? Uh, so that was Deswix. That was produced by a consultant. Uh, so it's a standard mining package. Uh, so it's more for mining engineers, but uh, as a geologist, you model the geology and then you give them the, the shapes you produced and then they just fit the uh, they fit the mine design to it. So from that, you can sort of see, uh, where is it back here? You, you can see that the vein is dipping sort of towards us. It's quite steep, almost 90. And it's just going this way along strike. Um, and that there is a natural break here because of the fault. So that's why we've got that gap. It's not just because we haven't drilled there. Um, but we, we actually use, for geology, we use Micromine, which is, uh, yeah, it's quite, quite a big package. Uh, they use it a lot in Australia, places like that. Um, but they're all sort of interchangeable, I guess, as you know. Just two questions for you. Uh, one, 
the geological environment you're finding the gold in, is it similar to any other places in the world? And two, if you, if you face a lot of local resistance due to the environmental impacts? Uh, so the geology, yeah, so the band extends through Scotland into Ireland, and it's Caledonian Morogeny was obviously a big mountain building event 400 million years ago. So part of this is in Scandinavia and also in, in the North America. Uh, we, I, we've had a lot of people that come to site and they've, they've all claimed, oh, I've seen this in Canada and stuff. So I think it is, but uh, it's the first, well, it's the second mining project I've worked on. So I don't have too much outside of sort of my studies uh, to compare it to. Uh, and then you, your second question, um, if, if you've been to Tyndrum and places like that, it's, it's, it's a, a quiet place uh, outside of the tourist season. Um, so it sort of relies on passing trade going up to the Isle, island of Skye and uh, to Fort William. So setting up a company that's going to employ 63 people and probably a half of those will be local people. It's, I think it's a big thing. Um, there wasn't much local opposition at all. Um, not been there at the time, but I think most of it was about how we were storing the tailings, and the plan was to have a big tailings pond. But now uh, we, we're doing the tailings stacks. So that was cleared the final hurdle, and we got approval. Um, but in, in terms of locals, uh, when they know we work at the mine, that they're not angry with us or anything. Most of them are interested. A lot of them want to know when we're going to produce gold so their shares go up. Um, <laughs> If, I think if you compare it to some of the projects in Ireland, they've got a lot more resistance. I think generally in Scotland, when you're out and about doing work, if, we, tr we try to keep it secret because obviously not everyone, we get permission to go there, but you still sort of do your work quietly. Um, but if people see us mapping or whatever, they're always really keen to know what we're doing. And yeah, so I don't think there's too much, to be honest. Got a quick question at the moment. Uh, you mentioned you had a recovery factor of 25%. Yes, in, is that yes. the gravity? That's gravity. gravity. So, yeah. so do you get more out after that? or? Yes, yeah, so the total recovery usually will be, uh, I don't know the final figure, it'll be about 97 or something. Um, so 25% is coming off as free gold. So instead of panning it, you basically put on the shaking table, which is just a mechanical version of, of a pan. Uh, or we put in spirals or a Nelson concentrator. Um, and these basically just increase the, the sort of principles on a larger scale and, and recover the gold. A uh, bit like what you see if you watch Gold Rush on TV, they're using shaking tables and stuff. So that's where the 25 comes from. And then the rest of it is flotation, which is uh, pretty standard in industry. And it uses various chemicals and reagents to float the pyrite to the surface using bubbles, and then you, you skim off the froth, which is like a dirty foam, and that has got all the uh, gold and the various sulfides in, and then that will be sent and smelted. And we're not doing that on the site, because obviously you can't smelt <laughs> in a national park. So. Yeah, so I, I had a question about your um, more than 60 employees. What sort of jobs oh, yeah, are they the going to be? I what they'll be doing as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, it's because we've got three... Two underground shifts, as it says there, but so there's, uh, I think there's five men on each shift, shift supervisor. So that's about 15 for the mining team. It's the same for the plant team because the plant is going to run, I think it's six days a week. Uh, Sunday will be like a, a down day for maintenance. So that's probably 30 there. And then there's the geology team, the admin team, finance team. Uh, yeah, so when you think about it, you get near to 60. <laughs> I'm not too sure what some of the others will be, but yeah. No, it's exciting stuff, for the, as you said, for the area, yeah. Got time for one, two more quick questions, if anyone has them. <laughs> um, yeah, I've got, uh, there are actually two, and I can think of many more, but <laughs> you, you were mentioning that that yellow horizontal it's, is the so original addits, that's where you go in? And it goes along here. Right. Um, I think there's quite a few, if you ever get up that way and you look at the waterfall, there's the old lead working. Yeah. So we actually went in one of those and it's, it's pretty fun because it's, it's called a coffin addit and it's basically the size of a coffin. So even I had no shoulder room. Um, so one of those is what we're using at the moment for the, so the ventilation goes in and then it's gases are coming out of that addit. Um, and then, yeah, these are the various sub-levels that 
15 meter intervals, and then we've got the ramps. The, so what I was going to ask about that is, I assume that every curve you've got in there is, yeah. is so that your equipment can drive down. Yeah, so it's all standard. Yeah. So I think it's one in seven, one in eight for the gradient of the spiral ramps. Uh, other ramps, I think, can be slightly steeper. Because um, you've got nine years to do this. So you're going to start off close by and then work your way further and yeah, further. Yeah, so I think the plan is to get over up to this bit first and then down and then and then back. So the blasting that you were showing us was effectively making of the tunnels. So at the moment, we're not doing the conventional mining because what we... We are mining, but we're widening the adit because on some of the pictures you see, it's got that, it's like a cave, it's the rounded profile, uh, which you can't go in with a rig. Um, you need a square profile. Um, and then it allows us more room for ventilation pipes and stuff like that. So that's what they've been doing at the moment. And they've been going along widening the adit. Um, and then just recently about here, they're breaking out and they're gonna do the spiral ramp. Um, so that is full face mining right. that just started. And now comes the geology, the actual geology question, yeah, yeah. which is you've been planning that mine accordingly. Yeah. But in the old days, they would have just followed the vein. Yeah. And if the vein ran out, that would be it. Yeah. But you think you've got everything mapped. No, but every no. When you've got all those, those um, stopes coming in, yeah. and you're actually processing the materials, it yeah. will be higher or lower grade. Yeah. So are you going to adjust this as you go yeah. along yeah so um yeah so uh, basically as a mine geologist what your job is to go in and when they've blasted you map the face because it's pressure exposure and if you don't map it the next shift will come in and blast it so you go in daily map it add it into your software and it's all data that helps you check if the model's accurate and refine it and then potentially if there's a fault that you didn't know about or something like that might offset the ore, then you, you pick it up and then you can trace it. And so it's an ongoing process. You, ne you never know the geology until you're there and you, you can actually see it in front of you. Uh, this is obviously a, a best estimate and pretty good one based on drilling. Um, but there's the potential that we can do underground drilling once we get up here maybe or down here and access places cheaper because we're not having to go from the surface, which is 400 meters up. Um, so there's a lot more potential. I think the deposit is open down dip and to the west. So there's the potential that Connish it could extend in the future. Good to hear. And um, the only thing is that 24,000 ounces, which you're going to get out of the next nine years, yep. equals to about two and a half to 3,000 ounces per year. And just to put that in perspective, that's 20,000 wedding rings. So hopefully you've got a market there. Sheila Fleet is going to be busy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's obviously not all going to be uh, jewelry and stuff yet. Uh, the remainder will just get sold uh, on the, on the open market. Um, but yeah, we 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 are obviously the first mine in Scotland, but on, on the grand scheme of things, so the mines in Australia that I've been to, mine would mine the equivalent that we're doing in nine years and one year. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a different scale to think about. Okay, well, thank you very much, George. That was um, excellent. Big round of applause, please.